Okay, hello again. This is Jim Ransom with another edition of uh, Morning Jim Poetry. I'm reading this to you on August 13. It's Saturday. And um, I missed last week, I'll have to confess, um, because we were on vacation in uh, at the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. <clears throat> And um, it, it's a land which is often called up there the Uper, the Uper. <laughs> that's what that's how they call the Upper Peninsula, the Uper. It was a land of sun and mild temperatures, even though we were not using air conditioning most of the time, and little or no humidity. There are mixed hardwoods and pine forests. Uh, it's a lot different than the high plains or the mountains of Colorado for comparison. It is a more settled looking area um, where the well-to-do from Chicago and other parts of the Midwest have come to get away from the heat and humidity, just like Kansans have traditionally done and Texans who have gone to Colorado <clears throat> in the heat of the summer. Um, and so we were able to walk downtown from the house we rented. Uh, it was in a little village called Harbor Springs. And <clears throat> we could go get wonderful coffee in the morning and uh, ice cream in the afternoon or evenings. Just what we needed. <laughs> or maybe I should speak for myself. Uh, but of course, it was wonderful. One day, the twins, Alex and Andrea, and I went out trolling for lake trout and caught our limit of six, um, the largest of which weighed 15 pounds, and the others were close to that. Um, lake trout are ubiquitous in the upper reaches of Lake Michigan, which was a surprise to me but we found it to be the case. <clears throat> um, we had a light breeze, no big waves, and really had fun. We were a little worried because Alex, my grandson, is somewhat prone to uh, seasickness. And he was scrambling around uh, the evening before we went out looking for some Dramamine. He knew he was going to get seasick, but he didn't. We had a light breeze, no big waves, and really had fun. Best of all, our two guides, Adam and Josh, cleaned the fish. <laughs> That's what it takes to make a great fishing trip. Now we have the makings of some great meals, and we've already had at least one meal from the lake trout. And uh, it was good. Okay, it's time to get down to the reason for our program, and that is poetry. And today we're going to read some poems by the late John Cole Ransom, who lived from 1888 to 1974, um, and <clears throat> some of whose work I read months ago. And you've heard me allude to him. He's one of my favorite poets. Um, here's <clears throat> the book it was given to me by Marsha, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that was back in uh, uh, 1978, and a hardbound book like this cost $8.95. Oh, <laughs> don't I wish I could buy a book. Uh, this good for that little in today's world. Okay, <clears throat> John Cole Ransom wrote poetry which is whimsical, uh, rueful, wryly humorous, and sometimes a little complicated, but not too much. If it were, I wouldn't get it. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to start with a relatively short 
poem which I have admired for years, and uh, I have more or less memorized it, but I'm I'm not going to take a chance, so I'm going to be reading it. It's called Janet Waking. Beautifully Janet slept till it was deeply morning. She woke then and thought about her dainty feathered hen to see how it had kept. One kiss she gave her mother, only a small one gave she to her daddy who would have kissed each curl of his shining baby. No kiss at all for her brother. Old Chucky, old Chucky, she cried running across the world upon the grass to Chucky's house and listening. But alas, her Chucky had died. It was a transmogrifying bee came droning down on Chucky's old bald head and sat and put the poison. It scarcely bled, but how exceedingly and purply did the knot swell with the venom and communicate its rigor. Now the poor comb stood up straight, but Chucky did not. So there was Janet, kneeling on the wet grass, crying her brown hen, translated far beyond the daughters of men, to rise and walk upon it. And weeping fast as she had breath, Janet implored us, Wake her from her sleep, and would not be instructed in how deep was the forgetful kingdom of death. This poem has most of the qualities I've mentioned earlier. Rueful, wry, somewhat humorous, in spite of the death of the hen, um, but not very complicated. It takes place in a rural setting, uh, but there are no shepherds present. I think we have to call it a lyric poem, yeah. And here's another one of his poems. <clears throat> it's called Blue Girls, Blue Girls. Let me straighten out this equipment here a little bit. Here we go. Blue Girls, twirling your blue skirts, traveling the sward under the towers of your seminary. Go listen to your teachers, old and contrary, without believing a word. Tie the white fillets, then, about your hair, and think no more of what will come to pass than bluebirds that go walking on the grass and chattering on the air. Practice your beauty, blue girls, before it fail, and I will cry with my loud lips and publish beauty, which all our power shall never establish, it is so frail. For I could tell you a story which is true. I know a woman with a terrible tongue, bluer eyes fallen from blue, all her perfections tarnished. And yet it is not long since she was lovelier than any of you. Uh, now, <clears throat> the seminary in this poem is the college campus, and the humor in it is like that of Mark Twain or Jonathan Swift. He is predicting, although with a wry smile, that one of the blue girls will turn out later to be the scold which he describes in the last stanza. And the lesson here for all of us is that we don't really know what the future holds. And um, 
happiness and and uh, an outstanding future may eventually turn into a blue future because many times we don't make the right choices but who's to say what they are especially when we're young and we're required to make choices without frequently wanting to but we do um, <clears throat> this next poem I'm going to read is called Winter Remembered Winter Remembered Two evils monstrous either one apart possessed me and were long at low at going a cry of absence, absence in the heart. And in the furious wood, the winter blowing. Think not when fire was bright upon my bricks and past the tight boards, hardly a wind could enter. I glowed like them, the simple burning sticks, far from my cause, my proper heat and center. Better to walk forth in the frozen air and wash my wound in the snows. That would be healing, because my heart would throb less painful there, being caked with cold and past the smart of feeling. And where I walked, the murderous winter blast would have this body bowed, these eyeballs streaming. And though I think this heart's blood froze, not fast. It ran too small to spare one drop for dreaming. Dear love, these fingers that had known your touch and tied our separate forces first together were ten poor idiot fingers, not worth much. Ten frozen parsnips hanging in the weather. That, <clears throat> that is a beautiful poem. What is it remembered? The other side of the place we just read about, the summer, was apparently not written. Ransom seemed always at his best when describing the tension between the day and night the best and worst, and the pangs of winter. He wrote most of his poems as a young man. Later, he became a professor at Kenyon College in Ohio and was a promoter of what came to be called the New Criticism and which demanded that a work be judged by its perfection of vocabulary and structure and not by its politics or its scientific view of things, etc. Um, that argument is still going on. And incidentally, John Coransom didn't actually write very much criticism of other writers himself. Uh, he was mostly teaching and writing about the theory of criticism. And in that, he, he shared that with Alan Tate and uh, Robert Penn Warren and several other poets in his age group. Uh, and they were all called the new critics. Okay, that's it for today. Maybe I finally got John Crow Ransom out of my system, at least for a while. <laughs> I'll see you next week. Goodbye and good luck.